Hi, this is Rebecca. Today we're going to cover the history of an atom. We're going to go through time, we're going to rewind all the way back to 400 BC, and we're going to look at how the atom became the atom that we now know of today. What were the processes and what were the breakthroughs that some of these scientists have made through time to help us understand what atoms are better? We're going to start with 400 BC, looking at Leucippus and Democritus. Then we're going to move forward in time to 1789, looking at Antoine Lavoisier. Then 1799, Joseph Louis Proust. 1805, John Dalton. 1896 to 1904, J.J. Thompson. And last but not least, Ernest Rutherford in 1909. Starting with Leucippus and Democritus, they came up with five main theories of atoms. Leucippus and Democritus are Greek philosophers, and they came up with, number one, matter is composed of atoms separated by empty space through which the atoms move. The second part they came up with was atoms are solid, homogeneous, indivisible, and unchangeable. Third, all apparent changes in matter result from changes in the grouping of these atoms. Four, there are different kinds of atoms that differ in size and shape. Five, the properties of matter reflect the properties of the atoms the matter contains. So at this point in time in 400 BC, you can see that majority of these theories that they came up with really are looking at defining matter a little bit better because matter is just a little bit too abstract at that point in time. So they came up with the concept of atoms. In 1789, Antoine Lavoisier came up with the law of conservation of mass. So what does that mean? It means that mass is neither created nor destroyed in a chemical reaction. Here's an example of a calcium chloride solution, and that calcium chloride solution is placed inside the test tube. We see sodium sulfate solution, and that solution is placed inside the conical flask, so it's kind of placed outside of that test tube. What Lavoisier did was that he tilted that conical flask and that liquid, the solution of calcium chloride, came out and mixed together with the sodium sulfate solution. Then he tilted it back and he put it back on the scale. In the beginning, the mass was 300.23 grams, that contains two of these individual solutions that have not been mixed together. After mixing, we see that the calcium chloride solution is mixed together with the sodium sulfate solution on the outside in the conical flask. However, we do see that the total mass is still the same. It's still 300.23 grams. Um, don't worry too much about what a precipitate means right now, uh, but just remember that Antoine Lavoisier at this point in time was able to prove that matter is mass is neither created nor destroyed in chemical reactions before and after a chemical reaction, the mass remained the same. In 1799, Joseph Louis Proust came up with the law of definite proportions. The definition to that means that a compound is always composed of the same proportions of elements by mass. So what does that mean? Um, we're going to look at a decomposition of water. Two moles of water decomposes into one mole of oxygen atom and two moles of hydrogen atom. Oxygen and hydrogen um, in standard conditions usually are appearing in double, so they appear in duo pairs. The mass of two moles of water is 36 grams. One mole of oxygen is 32 grams. And two moles of hydrogen atoms are four grams. So here we see, in this case, is that 36 in the reactant side is equal to 32 plus 4, which is also 36 in the products, right? This arrow tells us that this is the products and this is the reactant. 
So despite the fact that water has decomposed into two individual parts of oxygen and hydrogen separate, we do see that the mass remains the same. This means that this proportion, say if we increased this proportion, there's more moles of water, there's more water now. Um, if we double the moles of water and the mass results doubling to 72 grams, then we see naturally that if there's obviously more moles of water, then in the products, in the decomposition, there would be more moles of oxygen and more moles of hydrogen, right? So in the oxygen, we see it also doubles from 32 to 64, and we see hydrogen doubling from 4 to 8. Say we decide to add more water, so now there's 3 moles of water. Um, not 3 moles of water, but 3 times. Uh, the amount of moles of water here, then as a result, there would be approximately 108 grams in the reactant side. Once it decomposes, the oxygen would have about 96 grams and hy hydrogen would have about 12 grams. So we see that this proportion remains the same, right? The proportion, if it doubles in the reactant side, we see that in the product side, the decomposition here also doubles. If it triples, then it also triples in the products. John Dalton came up in 1805 the concept of atomic theory. There are four different parts to the atomic theory. This British scientist came up with the first part that elements are tiny indivisible particles, aka atoms. Um, atoms of the same element are identical atoms of different elements are different. So what Dalton is saying here is that a lithium atom is clearly different from a fluorine atom. They're not the same element. So only if they are both fluorine, then the atoms would be identical. But if the elements are not the same, clearly the, element, uh, the atoms will not be the same either. The third part is that elements combine in the same whole number ratios. And the fourth part is in a chemical reaction, atoms are not created nor destroyed. So uh, through time, we've been able to see through mass or through proportions or even here through the atomic theory that we're learning a lot about matter and a lot about the pieces of matter in terms of conservation. Um, we're recognizing that in a lot of cases, like the chemical reaction here, again, atoms are not created nor destroyed. In this example here that we covered uh, earlier, we do see here that the elements combine in the same whole number ratios. So we do see that there aren't any decimals right, in these combinations of the chemical reactions. From 19, uh, 1896 to 1904, J.J. Thompson came up with the idea of the electrons, as well as using the plum pudding model to illustrate um, where the electrons reside. This is JJ Thompson, and this is his plum pudding model. JJ Thompson used a cathode ray tube to figure out and disproved Dalton's first theory that elements are tiny indivisible particles. What he found were three pieces of the electrons. He found that there are electrons. There are some negatively charged particles in atom. Um, he found that it must be part of an atom. Otherwise, where did this negatively charged particle come from? And he also found that electrons were approximately 1 over 2,000 the mass of a hydrogen atom. So they're really, really tiny. What this shows you is where he came up with the concept of a plum pudding model. So um, as a British scientist um, in Britain, they love to eat plum pudding. And so he figured that plum pudding was a great way to describe his revolutionary idea of how the electrons were situated in an atom. Ernest Rutherford in 1909 built upon J.J. Thompson's idea of the plum pudding model, but but found something else in an atom. He found the nucleus uh, through the gold foil experiment. Thompson, through his cathode ray tube experiment, was able to find some negatively charged particles that he called electrons. 
and these are dotted as blue. Ernest Rutherford, however, through his gold foil experiment, was able to find that oddly, when he ran his experiment, there was some form of deflection of alpha particles. And he was thinking, okay, so um, clearly not everything is negative inside the atom. And so this is where the positively charged center came from. This is an example of um, his gold foil experiment. And you see that there was a thin gold foil here. Uh, the experiment, we're not going to get go into too much of a detail, but just that there were radium source of alpha particles that were essentially, he was thinking that this experiment was probably going to further support J.J. Thompson's theory. But after he ran this experiment, he found that instead of completely just uh, the rays kind of going through the foil, oddly, there were pieces of alpha particles that were deflected. So not all of it just went straight through that get thin gold foil. So through this, he was able to, to come up with the theory that there must be some positively charged center. So essentially, this was J.J. Thompson's idea, but um, when, when Ernest Rutherford went, ran through his gold foil experiment, he saw some form of deflection. And so this positive piece that J.J. Thompson came up with that he thought was just scattered throughout the atom is actually very centralized in Ernest Rutherford's finding. He found that 1 in 2,000 of the alpha particles that he ran through deflected. He came up with the nuclear model, uh, the nuclear model meaning there's a nucleus. And through this model, he was able to find that majority of the positive sent the positive particles were all found in the center so again just to cover through the entire period of time on how an atom is what we see now with a positive center and electrons around it it came from Leucippus and Democritus in coming up with the concept of defining atoms uh, from matter in 400 BC. Then Antoine Lavoisier coming up with the law of conservation of mass in 1789. Then Joseph Louis Proust coming up with the law of definite proportions in 1799. Then John, John Dalton came about in 1805 and came up with the atomic theory that composes of four theories. In 1896 through to 1904, J.J. Thompson came up with the electrons and the plum pudding model. And in 1909, Ernest Rutherford came up with the nucleus and the gold foil experiment. If you enjoyed learning about the history of the atom, seeing how these scientists have gone through multiple trials of experimentation to deliver what we now know as an atom, uh, please don't forget to click the like button and subscribe. Thank you.